Well, good morning. It's good to have you all with us. It's a nice day. It's a great day to be here, and it's a great day to be in the book of Hebrews in the ninth chapter. Our speaker this morning is Thomas Dodds. Thomas will be bringing us for two weeks now the remainder of Hebrews chapter 9, and I am anxious to get into this even further and to hear what he has to say and hear what the Lord has laid on his heart. And those of you who are tuning in with us, uh, I would welcome you to email us at Bethel Bible Chapel at earthlink.net or on Facebook or however you're watching us. Let us know uh, what you're thinking of these studies in the book of Hebrews because uh, it is amazing. It's an amazing book and it's a privilege to be here. Our speaker, Thomas Dodds. Good morning. So, part two of Hebrews chapter nine, part one of me doing it. <laughs> and if you missed uh, Malin's message last week, I would encourage you to uh, get it out of the archives. It's excellent. And uh, he covered a few verses uh, and he, he apologized for it and He's not here for me to tell him, don't ever do that. No. You can touch a verse in Hebrews more than once. So Hebrews chapter 9, and we're going to concentrate on the portion of the chapter between verses 15 and 22. And I've titled today, and uh, here's my apology to Bill. I didn't send him an outline. I know, I'm terrible. We'll blame it on the pain meds that I don't take. <laughs> um, it's a necessary death. That's the title. The death of Christ is a necessary death, and we'll get into what we mean by that. But by way of introduction, if I can give a very, very short summary of the book of Hebrews so far, it aims at the superiority of Christ as a person, as a priest, as the maker of a covenant, and as a sacrifice. Let's ask him for his help. Our God and our Father, as we have your word open this morning, we do beg a, an extra measure of your spirit that we might enter into, in a deeper fashion, so as to grow our faith, but we would enter into a deeper fashion of what Christ has suffered for our sakes. Amen. That we might have a deeper appreciation. We might say of the manifold blessings of God in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we ask these things this morning with thanksgiving in his precious and in his worthy name. Amen. So if we take a look at Hebrews chapter 9 and we read just the first verse that we have before us, <clears throat> 15, it says, For this reason he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. And I'm going to stop there because the chapter actually has a division there. Um, we, you know, divisions in chapters and the way your Bible may be laid out on the page is not an inspired thing. Um, but there's a natural break between 15, verse 15 and verse 16. And it's important to see that break because the writer sets us up for a, for a further understanding. For this reason, he is the mediator sorry, of a new covenant. He's the go-between. He's the go-between. What does that mean? What does that mean? Abraham had a covenant with God where the, the pieces were laid out. 
and God himself went between. What does that mean? God wouldn't let Abraham go between, so much so that he put him to sleep. Boy, my parents, if they had that option as a, when I was a child. Hmm? We'd like you to obey. Go to sleep. Now you can't get off your chair in the middle of a Sunday morning service. You can't do the things you normally do. Right? God took it upon himself to be the go-between. Christ is the go-between. There is none other. There is one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. But he's a mediator of a new covenant. Well, what's a covenant? The word covenant that we have translated into English here has a, a multitude of, of meanings, connotations, intents, and depending on the context in which it's found, it can mean very different things. That is why we split verse 15 from verse 16. But a covenant can be a compact, or a covenant as we traditionally think of it as. My marriage to Joanne is not a contract. I did not say I will never leave you if I get three square meals a day. I get three square meals a day, make no mistake. No, it was a compact. I promised no matter what. She promised no matter what. I don't recall, I think his name was Pastor Roos. I don't recall Pastor Roos telling me to say my vows and then looking at her and said, well, since he promised, now you have to. That's not the way it went. It's not the way it went. We chose to promise to each other. It's a compact. The other way covenant is used is a disposition or an arrangement. That's verse 16. And we'll get into that, and we'll get into why. So God had a compact or a covenant with people. God initiated the covenant with people. So that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the violations, that's the bad news. And we're going to look at that covenant. But a death has taken place for the redemption of the violations. You know, to violate a compact, there's a price to be paid. There always is. You may not have pre-agreed to it, but there's always a price to be paid. Christ redeems the violations of the first compact by his death. He pays the penalty of covenant broken. And they were committed under the, that first covenant. But why does he do this? There's a purpose. It's not just to ratify or fix the covenant. It's not what he's doing. It does do this. Those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. You know, to, for him to die to redeem the violations that were committed under the first covenant would be the negative side of it. Right? I break the law and I get pulled over and I get a ticket. I have to pay that ticket. That's the negative side of it. The positive side of it is presented here. Those who have been called may receive the promise of the internal, eternal inheritance. Those who have been called, let's turn to Romans chapter 3. It's important to see this. Uh, I had a discussion with uh, a guy earlier this week. Mm -hmm. 
who uh, he basically stated that salvation, the blood of Christ, covers your past sins, but doesn't cover your present or future ones. Well, let's let's see what what the Word of God says. Romans chapter 3, and if we read verses 21 through 26, it says, But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, that is, the Old Testament scriptures, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. Make no mistake. Righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, is presented, and I'm just going to say it this way, somewhere between Genesis and Malachi, and I would say everywhere between Genesis and Malachi. You know, we often take the Old Testament, well, that's, that's historical and we need to be, and, and I'm saying this, we do need to be careful about the context of things. But Paul here, by the Spirit of God, tells us in no uncertain terms, that the Old Testament does present us the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all those who believe. It's important we see that. It says, for there is no distinction. There's no distinction between them and us. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Being justified as a gift, by his grace, through the redemption which is in Jesus Christ, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. If your faith in Jesus Christ only covers what you did in the past, this passage makes no sense because Paul, again by the Spirit, says, Christ was made a public demonstration that covered the couple lies Abraham told. Yes. The failings of Moses, yes. David's murder and stealing the wife of Uriah, yes. If the blood of Christ and his salvation covered them retroactively for their whole lives, what makes us think today that the blood of Christ doesn't cover what I might do tomorrow? And that's the argument I often get. Yeah, but I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow. I can have no assurance of my salvation. I can't have... Stop making it about you. Amen. Stop making it about you. You know, I stand before you today as someone who celebrated yesterday 46 years of being a son. Yeah, my adoption went through 46 years ago. Was it about me? Not for a second. No, my parents didn't go through the Children's Aid Society there in Ottawa, and, and I, I, you know, <laughs> polished my shoe. <laughs> Much on the contrary. You might say I was unadoptable. So much so that my father's mother said, you're nuts. <laughs> she was not in favor. He's not going to live. The doctors were, ah, he's not going to live. Don't get involved with this kid. So no. Not of me. And what isn't even the potential that I might be? I made a joke to my dad yesterday. It said, I'm the most expensive, long-held investment you've ever had without a return. <laughs> He said, there's still hope. <laughs> but think about it. Think about it. How often did I grieve him despite what he did for me? 
Yeah, I was a teenager, to make no mistake. I was a typical teen. You never held it over my head. No, he expected a certain level of behavior, but he never said, you need to do this because I did this for you. No. Yeah, it's not lost on me the position that comes with the gift. Those who have been called May receive what? It's the promise. You know, I can promise my son lots of things. And as dads, we need to be careful what we promise. It may be he'll hold me to my word. You know? Sure, yeah, yeah, you're four now, but when you're 16, I'll get you a car. <laughs> you think he forgets that kind of stuff? Never. Never, right? Now he's got 10 months to go, nine months to go, eight months to go. Yeah. I'm trying to think if I ever told him as a four-year-old I'd get him a car. <laughs> I probably did, though. This is not that kind of promise. We've had it before in Hebrews. God made a promise, and God keeps his promises but so much so that he interposed it with an oath. He added the compact to the promise. Oh. Doubly sure. And I often tell people that you're doubly sure as a son or a daughter of God. You're not only adopted, you are born. You are adopted and you are born. Christ dies here in this verse so that those in the past receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. You know, we talk about eternal life for us today. It's the same here. This is what this is. It's eternal Yes, it's never-ending. It's age-enduring. But this is more a commentary on the quality of the inheritance than the quantity. You can't understand the quantity. And you can scarce scratch the quality. Think about that for a second. You know the number one thing when Paris Hilton was running around in the early 2000s acting like an idiot... People would call her out for what? Her heritage. She's the heiress to the Hilton fortune. Act like it, right? We are heirs of the eternal inheritance. Yes, it's age enduring, but it's of a quality that is met with the same quality that God is. And that's a harsh way of saying it. We don't understand the quality of God. But that's his promise to us, is to give us in kind. He doesn't promise us something that's somebody else's. He promises that which is his, uniquely his, and recognizably his. It's the eternal promise. The eternal inheritance, you know, the great thing about an inheritance is you don't earn it. You can't. You can't inherit by earning. You inherit by relation. That's how you inherit. You can inherit by, from someone who's not your blood relative, but you had to be related to them in some way. They picked you out for a reason. They related to you. It's a possession that's acquired through gift by divine lot. I stand before you as an heir. As an heir. My name is on a will. 
I didn't earn it. My dad's oldest sister passed away, and she put every single one of her name, of her nieces and nephews, on her will. I didn't even know my name was on that will. But I'm an heir. God has done the very same thing with you and me. He has promised us an eternal inheritance. It's not a reward for doing good. Some people think it is. It's not. We can have rewards for doing good. But salvation itself is not a reward for doing good. It's a gift by divine lot. You know, I look around the room and everybody here has a different last name. The last name you have is by divine lot. It's not by happenstance that you were born a Besselman. It's not happenstance that you were born a Smith. It's not happenstance, none of that. It's by divine lot. You were placed Your salvation is a very similar placing. It's a very similar placing. So I mentioned to my birth mother that yesterday was my adoption day. That's got to be a tough thing to hear. Her response is, you were put in the exact right place you should be. It's exactly what I'm telling you. You were put into that family not by happenstance. But Jesus Christ has suffered that you might receive that inheritance. And really it's the right to the possession. It can't be taken from you. It can't be taken from you. So, that's verse 15. So, somebody in the room texted me last night and said something about if I finish early. <laughs> didn't, have the, didn't, have, didn't have the heart to tell them that has never happened. Um, three o'clock, you'll all be hungry. So verse 16 is a natural break, and it goes in this week and into next week. And the writer of Hebrews gives us three reasons why the death of Christ was a necessary death. Three reasons why Christ's death was a necessary death. One is that a testament or a will requires a death. It just follows. It's a logical thought. Forgiveness demands bloodshed. That is a divine requirement. And salvation demands a victim. And that's next week. So we have three reasons. A will requires a death. Forgiveness demands bloodshed. And salvation requires a victim. Verse 16 says, For where there is a covenant in our English Bibles, you can read that as a will or a last testament. It's a disposition or an arrangement. And usually we do this at the end of our lives. Right? We have our last will and testament. and We divide up our earthly possessions of those who survive. So, for there is a, a will, there must of necessity, it's necessary, be the death of the one who made it. For a will is only valid when men are dead. It's never in force while the one who made it lives. In our modern world, we have this idea of a a living will, but it's usually an advanced directive to our medical care. I had one of those. It didn't divide up my earthly possessions. It merely handled the fact that if I'm to an incapacitated state, someone should act in my behalf. That's not what's being referred to here. So the disposition of the will of God, (laughs) 
We often talk about the will of God as being a bunch of other things, but he did have a will in this sense. And it gets enacted upon death. Well, you have God is life. He's the source of life. How does he die? God's will in last testament represents an impossibility with us. It's an impossibility. How does God die? Christ come in the flesh. Think about that. What a like <laughs> Yeah. Have we ever thought about that? For God to do what he wanted to do all along, it required his passing away. Wow. Wow. For him to give us that inheritance, by default, he has to pass away. You know, I don't like talking will and last testament with my dad. I don't. He's put me as an executor. He wants to talk about it. I don't. Why? It doesn't represent the possession of things to me. It represents the, the guy gone. Is that the way we look at our salvation? Yes, we benefit, but it required a death. There's lots of kids these days that get a huge inheritance. And it's gone faster than those who win a lottery. Are we that flippant with our salvation? For us to have right to the possession of eternal life required God's passing away. So the internal inheritance cannot be dispensed until verse 15 happened. It's the big setup. And so you have those Old Testament saints who lived by faith. And sometimes we wonder, well, how much they, could they have known? Jesus Christ himself said of Abraham, he saw my day and rejoiced in it. Don't discredit what they knew by revelation, by faith. It may not be recorded for us in the Old Testament. It may not be a thing that we think of of Abraham. But make no mistake, Jesus Christ, the eternal son, knew what Abraham knew. And he tells us. But Abraham couldn't have the benefit of the inheritance until the death of the one who wrote the will. Think about that. Some of those guys lived a long time. Moses lived three sets of 40 years. Makes me look young, doesn't it? What about you, Russ? Makes you look young. Yeah. All along, couldn't have the benefit that you and I live today. Think about that. No access to it. Oh, yeah, he might have known that he was on the will. No possession of the inheritance. You and I today have possession of the inheritance. I get told this all the time. No, you'll get the inheritance when you yourself die. That makes no sense. Quite frankly, I don't have to die for my earthly inheritance to come to me. Somebody else dies, then I get mine. True? Yeah. Yeah. Because if that were true, if that thought is true, the whole idea of a last will and testament makes no sense. 
And it is one of the reasons why the death of Christ was necessary. And a last will and testament, and I want to be clear on this, is not a bargain between two people. It's not a bargain between two people. It's a gift of the one who writes the will. Oh, I know in our modern day, people get mad and they they run off to the lawyer and change their last will, right? It's not the way God looks at it. It's not the way God looks at it. This is not a bargain. Your salvation is not a deal between you and the Lord. It's not. Therefore, verse 18, even the first covenant was not inaugurated or commenced, opened without blood. For when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took of the blood of calves and of the goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. In the same way, he sprinkled both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry with blood. Exodus chapter 19. We're going to stick in Exodus for a while here because this is exactly where the writer of Hebrews is. We tend to look at paraphrasing as as a negative thing, but that's what he's doing. He's giving us a summary, a synopsis, if you were. Exodus chapter 19 and verse 5. Now if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And verse 8, the people respond, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And so we have this instantiation of a covenant. Then what happens? Then what happens? Well, chapter 20, we get the Ten Commandments. The very first thing the covenant requires deportment, if I can put it that way. I'm a Dodds. I'm expected to act like one. They're not perfect. But I'm expected to act like one. What's one of the known things about the Dodds? They're a Christian family. They're not all exactly conformed and uniform. But there's a, there's a vein in which that family runs. God here tests the people. He says, all right, if you want to be on the will, I'll put you in that position, but you have to act like you're in that position. And he gives them the Ten Commandments. How well did that go? I think there's a record of one guy who actually had... The, the gall, maybe, to tell the Lord Jesus Christ, yeah, I kept all that since I was a kid. Just one guy. But he was still missing something, wasn't he? Nobody kept it. There were people who desired to, make no mistake. And there were people who did very well at it, make no mistake. But perfection was not found there. We've seen that in Hebrews. There was no perfection until Christ came. So if we go a little further in chapter 20, and if you go to verse 24, it says, You shall make an altar 
of earth for me, and you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen, in every place where I cause my name to be remembered. And I will come to you and bless you. And if you make an altar of stone for me, you shall not build it out of cut stones. For if you wield your tool on it, you will profane it. And you shall not go up by steps to my altar, so that your nakedness will not be exposed on it. You might say, well, that's a strange thing to point to. Well, if you were given rules and regulations, and you kept them perfectly, there's no need of an altar and sacrifice, is there? There isn't. God delivers the law and he delivers grace right along with it. He delivers it right along with it. And again, we say, you know, stop making it about you. The altar was not to have cut stones. You know what cut stones do versus natural stones? Fit together easily. <laughs> Right? Natural stones are rough. They're different shapes. They're different sizes. Cut stones, bricks, fit together in nice straight lines. God doesn't want your handiwork in the sacrifice. God doesn't want your handiwork in the sacrifice. In fact, so much so, don't even dare put that altar up on steps. Because you elevate yourself and everybody below you sees what? It's here. It sees your backside. Think about that. You might say, well, if I elevate my, my altar, then I'm closer to God, and then I'm up there, and I have to look up to him. Everybody behind you sees what? It's a shame. You and I, adding to our salvation, profanes it and makes it a shame. Good intention, yes. But God is clear. What would my dad think of me if we uh, reviewed the will and then I turned to him and said, well, in that case, uh, um, I, would, I would like the opportunity um, to be your hired servant. I'm no more worthy to be called your son. Sound familiar? <laughs> right? That'd be an insult to him, wouldn't it? Be an insult to him. Oh, no, 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 dad, dad, dad. I'll, I'll work for this. What does that do to the other three siblings? All they see is my backside, right? We cannot add to what Christ has done. Amen. Because it's not our will to add to. All we do is profane it. And then we keep going in, ver in chapters 21, 22, and 23. He, reco he recounts, you might say, the behavior that is commensurate with people who are on the will. And if you read through it, it's pretty, it's pretty detailed. It covers all sorts of things. And then verse 1 of chapter 24, Then God says to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel and you shall worship at a distance. Well, you shall worship at a distance. This morning, did we worship at a distance? No. Why? We had a God who saw us at a distance. And he had compassion on us. And he ran. 
and he embraced us and he kissed us. Oh, you can't get any closer. These ones at a distance. Moses alone, however, shall come near to the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people come up with him. Wasn't Aaron the high priest? Not yet. The access to God, you might say, for all intents and purposes, completely restricted. Completely restricted. And then verse 3, it says, Moses came and recounted to all the people the words of the Lord and all the ordinances. So he goes back over. This is the second time. He goes back over. Chapter 19, 20, 21, 22, and 23. And the people repeat with one voice all the word which the Lord has spoken, we will do. And if we keep reading, it says, Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord, and he arose early in the morning, and he built the altar at the foot of the mountain with the 12 pillars for the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the sons of Israel, and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as peace offerings to the Lord. And Moses took half the blood and put it in basins. Half the blood. There's people in the room that can't take one little vial at Quest Diagnostics. Think about this for a second. He had to get the youth of the nation to round up the cattle. The writer of Hebrews will get into the bloody situation that was the Old Covenant. I don't think we really realize how messy it really was. And there's a reason for that, that it was messy. Then he took the book of the covenant and he read it in the hearing of the people and they said, it's the third time they've said it, all that the Lord has spoken we will do. So Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. So the new covenant was inaugurated with blood. And that's exactly what the writer of Hebrews 9, or the whole letter of Hebrews, is referring to. If we go back there for a minute. And I want to notice something here. We're running out of time. It says that in number 19, verse 19, for when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and the goats. There wasn't goats back. Just, just in case you're wondering. It's not, a, it's not an insertion. We'll get to Why? With the water and scarlet wool and hyssop. Again, he's not editing the Exodus account. And sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God had commanded you. Here it is. And in the same way, he sprinkled both the tabernacle. That did not exist. That's Leviticus. Moses, Moses, when something changed and the priesthood came, Moses never forgot the covenant of God. Moses never forgot. He didn't say, oh, well, the priesthood replaces that. Now we're good. And you don't find that with the writer of Hebrews either. He sprinkled both the tabernacle and all the vessels of ministry. 
with blood. So the initial covenant, and then it gets expanded, all point to Christ. So a word of caution, if we read through Leviticus, and we come up with something, and we say, well, you know, this picture is so-and-so, and it's not Christ, we'd be wrong. I get told the Ark of the Covenant represents his earthly mother Mary. I get told that all the time. Not according to Hebrews. Not according to Hebrews. There is no way that the mercy seat of God sits on Mary. Oh no. When the blood is applied, the mercy seat of God is Christ Jesus himself. He has shed the blood of the covenant. This, in the past, pointed to him. Melinda was clear. Mark has been clear. Jerry has been clear. Everyone who has spoken from Hebrews 1 to Hebrews 9.21 has been clear. Because the book is clear. The book is clear. And what we find in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 28, what does Jesus Christ say? He says exactly in kind and in pattern. This is the blood of the new covenant which is shed for you. Don't miss the similarity. And we might look at our Christianity rather clinically. It's no less bloody. And I say that reverently. It's no less bloody. It required, it necessitated the death of Christ himself. In verse 22, as we wrap up here, and almost all things are cleansed with blood according to the law, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Aren't you glad he said almost all? <laughs> I got Sam to look up real quick. There was a provision in the law for a tenth of an ephod of flour. Make no mistake of the grace of God. If you couldn't afford two measly turtle doves or two young pigeons, you had a way. I'm sure there was those in Israel that could afford a bullock for everybody in the room here. And there were those in Israel who might have had to borrow flour from you. Almost everything. Think about that. The grace of God. And the writer of Hebrews picks up on that very, very, Small detail. According to the law and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. You know, those law and ordinances about the sacrifices came because of that truth there. They did not establish that truth. We need to be clear. God established the truth and then patterned the law and the ordinances and the sacrifices to that standard. Leviticus 17.11 says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you, it being the blood, on the altar to make atonement for your soul. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. You know, whenever we talk about the blood of Christ being applied to us, it's tantamount to saying the death of Christ being applied to us. The death of Christ was a necessary death. 
Necessary because the will requires the death of the one who wrote it. God wrote the will. God being the everlasting eternal God had to die. And forgiveness demands blood. A couple weeks ago I made the I made the comment that forgiveness doesn't ignore justice. The old sacrificial system and its summary in the book of Hebrews is proof positive that justice was never overlooked. But forgiveness comes out by trickles? No. For as bloody as that was, the forgiveness is greater. Amen. And for as imagine, if we could imagine the worth of the life of Christ given as a sacrifice for us, the forgiveness is bigger than that. Because the forgiveness doesn't just do the redemption of the violation. It doesn't just clear my sin. It makes me an heir and a joint heir with Christ. His death is a necessary death. Let's ask for, him, for his help. Our God and our Father, we do pray that as we have the death of Christ before us, it have its impact on us. That while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And yes, it removes our sin. but so much more. It brings us into relationship with God as Father and us as sons and daughters. Born anew. New creation. Adopted. Selected, received, and approved. And given the inheritance, even now. And so we ask, we give thanks now in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.